pure audible value here. Thanks, Kabir. Uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. It's really a pleasure addressing NRIs through this webinar who are very keen to understand about what's happening in India, specifically when it comes to real estate sector. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, walk you through a presentation which is uh, very crisp to to an extent that you know it really highlights why not why real estate still looks attractive as an asset class in India and how do we see real estate doing in the in in the coming years and months specifically when it comes to appreciation, especially when it comes to dynamics in India. Uh, the, the, the presentation uh, which basically captures the gist, uh, let me walk you through uh, slides which are basically capturing the uh, uh, primary reasons what, why, we feel, why we feel we are bullish about real estate in India. Coming to the, uh, the outlook, uh, real estate continues to be a significant asset class in a lot of high net worth individuals portfolios. And of late, in last 15 odd years, we've seen uh, with IT and ITES services doing really well, has actually uh, moved, made the urbanization a very, very primary factor in most parts of India. When we look at uh, cities like Bangalore, cities like Pune, city like Chennai, Gurgaon, which were not to an extent uh, what they are today in terms of size, in terms of potential, in terms of you know urbanization, which has happened in the last 10 to 15 years. Primarily factor being the IT and IT enabled services. Now if you look at what was it before uh, May 2014 and what is it post May 2014, there is a ray of hope, there is a possibility of reforms and what makes us bullish is the gridlock, what was being shown in the screen, but something which is basically the mindset which was there till we basically had the new government. And post the new government, with a lot of policy reforms in the pipeline, makes us feel that we are in a situation where we can actually have much more structured way of growth than a haphazard growth. So this is what the visual actually captures in a simple way of you know, presenting the Indian scenario pre-May 2014 and post-May 2014. What were the problems, where are the solutions, and what are the remedies? Let me quickly share, I don't think this is not, everybody knows this, but let, for, to, sum, to sum it up in simple way, the, the problem today, what we see is lack of transparency and lack of, lack of accountability. If I meet not only any non-resident Indian, a resident Indian who is in India has this very simple complaint that you know the developer or the real estate industry is not as transparent as internationally. That is a big thing today in terms of most critical partners, how this is leading to real confusion in investors' mind. Coming to procedural delays, coming to approval delays, which you know, the developer community feels there is a lot more uh, process which is basically not simplified, that is one of the biggest challenges today. Shortage of serviced un urban land, this is again a challenge which we believe this government making right kind of uh, noises in terms of setting up 100 smart cities, that is making us much more confident. Infrastructure growth not being in a pace what we should be, it should be, with a lot more rollouts of you know, infrastructure uh, uh, metro or you have this rapid metro and you have many other things which are happening in the last 5-7 uh, years, we see the pace picking up once we have a clarity in terms of 100 smart cities. Liquidity being a challenge which still is and uh, we don't see a short term solution but yes certainly a long term solution through REITs. Rigid investment options and limited options. Primarily again this is with the REITs coming into play in India. We believe this is something which will be next five years we will see it dynamically a different scenario. Keeping all this in mind with a regulatory bill which is basically supposedly getting tabled in the parliament this year. Uh, we will see if it gets passed and we are very hopeful it will get passed which will actually structure the real estate industry to a great extent. Not only it will structure the developers but also the service providers like brokers like we as JLL who basically become a service provider will also get, get structured and a lot of unorganized world in this country which has basically created a lot more confusion will come under the bill will basically give it more clarity. Moving to the uh, growth. What was the industry in 2010 and what was the industry in 2013? 
industry has been growing. We were a hundred billion dollar industry, and today we stand in 2013. The number number shows 235 billion dollars, and this is a number. 2014 is yet to come out, but we basically believe this is almost in spite of having hundreds of problems we have in this industry, but we've seen the growth is not being compromised considering the kind of urbanization what we've seen and considering the kind of you know rapid growth the cities have seen irrespective of last few governments have not been so robust in their strategy. If you look at almost 80%, 82% of the asset class revolves around residential. If you look at office space and retail space, it's a very small portion currently, but that residential is something which is basically getting cured in terms of growth, primarily once the commercial uh, sector revives. Let me share some statistics which are not on the slide, which are very interesting statistics, specifically when it comes to uh, commercial real estate. Now, a lot of people will wonder, commercial real estate I am referring to is an A-grade commercial buildings, specifically which are occupied by large companies which are like Wipro, Infosys, Tata Communications, Tata, uh, TCS, Accenture, Cognizant, name company which they occupy the commercial real estate. Commercial real estate dynamics in India, if you look at net absorption in India, I am referring to net absorption as people who have you know, surrendered their existing offices and taken up new offices, the net absorption number of last year was around 29 million square feet across seven cities of India. And you will be surprised to note in the last five year trend, this trend reflects that four cities which are really emerging faster in terms of pace, in terms of growth, in terms of expansion, which nobody would actually see it uh, in terms of uh, uh, ground level activity. But we see it, the way we see it is Bangalore today almost contributes to almost six million square feet net absorption per annum. And that is little more than what Bombay does. So it's not that Delhi and Bombay still continue to be the last two cities of India when it comes to commercial, commercial establishment and commercial net office consumption. We've seen Bangalore almost overtaking Mumbai. We've seen Pune almost coming neck to neck with Mumbai. Chennai is significant today and we have Gurgaon which is significant today. Hyderabad which, has, which was one of the uh, key runners in the last uh, uh, one decade has seen the slowdown in the last three, four years considering the political situation there. And now that getting resolved, we believe Hyderabad also should be into back into action. Keeping in mind, we always thought Bombay or Delhi will attract maximum number of jobs. The number of jobs which are getting opened up or becoming a large uh, pool in terms of talent availability, Bangalore, Pune, Gurgaon, and Chennai are the favorites today when it comes to IT and IT enabled services considering the talent availability and considering the cost there. That has been a very big game changer especially in coming to Indian real estate. The residential assets in most of the cities have seen dynamic scenarios in terms of growth, in terms of capitalization. We will go into the slides later and let's show you how this trend is actually emerging. Quickly coming to uh, uh, the asset classes, asset types, what is in the spotlight? We've seen $22.6 billion of private equity key investments coming into India in the last six years. And if you see the graph, clearly reflects the land as an asset class is the biggest attraction there. Specifically when it comes to 2008 to 2013. And if you see the next largest share of pie has been taken away by townships. Other asset classes have not actually caught up to these two asset classes. This clearly reflects that land is something which is basically the best uh, investment asset class where private equities have got attracted to. Now let me share with you what is happening in the institutional side which is basically uh, the key driver in the last few years. What are they doing? Specifically the larger names like Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, GIC, Qatar, Blackstone, what are they doing? You'll be surprised to see that Blackstone has partnered to acquire almost 17 million square feet of commercial assets in India in the last few years. And when these get activated, Blackstone will be the largest player after a few big names which are listed like DLF, uh, uh, there is Gareja Corp, or there is Prestige. So there are a few other names, but Blackstone becomes a very significant large player in the last few years that has been that has surprised everybody. Then looking at focused on uh, residential assets, who are the people who are basically very active? 
we've seen JP Morgan quite active, specifically in tier 1 and tier 2 cities, in going and partnering with developers, specifically in the equity assets there. It's their partnering along with developers to construct townships which are coming up in India. Through funds, Abu Dhabi uh, Investment Authority has been very active by investing into 14 different funds in India to specifically acquire assets which are not just restricted to commercial but also residential. So this strategy reflects that you know, there is a lot more confidence coming into India from the fund strategy point of view. Now with the clarity in terms of new government being very focused on this, so we may see individuals we're getting more and more activated on this front. This is a lot of numbers on the slide. I mean, I, I, it looks very confusing this point of time, but I will certainly walk you through the numbers, which will actually make you feel that what I what I what am I sharing in this slide? Let me walk you through specifically. <coughs> sorry. When I, when I refer to the point that other cities are catching up, this slide primarily captures captures the rent movement pre 2008. That was a boom. That was a boom period in terms of best period India had seen with pre Lehman crisis and post Lehman crisis. So this number is reflect that how rents have been behaving in India in the specific cities we have identified and what has been the trend in this case of scenario. If you see this trend reflects that Bangalore has actually gone back to pre-2008 levels when it comes to rents. That is a clear indication that Bangalore is leading the change of dynamics in India, specifically when it comes to employment, when it comes to basically new businesses getting opened there. We've seen recently a lot of retail story of unveiling in Bangalore, because Bangalore is not, not just an ID and enabled service uh, city. And now you see Flipkart and you see many other companies are getting originated in Bangalore. A lot of startups which are actually in Bangalore. So if you're looking at uh, Bangalore leads that with almost it has surpassed, almost closer to surpassing in terms of pre-2008 rental levels. Then you see the second the second biggest uh, highlight there is Chennai, which is actually uh, being very close to Bangalore in terms of recovery. And then we have is Kolkata, we have Hyderabad, we have uh, Gurgaon. Now we have defined Gurgaon into two, Gurgaon Prime and Gurgaon uh, uh, other thing. Primarily keeping in mind uh, the, the design of Gurgaon in terms of there is a DLF and non-DLF. So in, in short, this is how we can define uh, DLF and surrounding areas, that's what I'm referring to. If you see the cities like Mumbai, which is still at 62 versus 100, what it was in pre-2008, this clearly reflects at how Delhi and Mumbai are showing the growth versus other cities. The other cities basically have caught up very fast on the commercial space, whereas uh, cities like Mumbai and Delhi, which were leading to 2008, are a little slow in terms of recovery. Moving to the slide of residential, uh, this is where you may be reading a lot of uh, reports in the media which will say that there is a lot of supply in residential, residential sector is going through one of the bad periods, worst periods and stuff like that, a lot of supply hangover and stuff. When we see the recovery from pre-2008 and post-2008, post-2008, considering the, what India has gone through in terms of slowdown, in terms of no policy, in terms of no new establishments getting in established, so what has resulted is there is an inventory pileup which has happened and we are quite confident with the business recovery and business moving fast enough, there will be more and more jobs coming in and that will help us in terms of you know taking the inventory from the shelf which is currently lying on the shelf. So let me walk you through again this slide, a lot more numbers on the slide, let me make it easy for you to understand what am I referring to. I am referring to capital values pre-2008 and post-2009, which is basically the lull period we saw in the last uh, uh, in the, la the last five, seven years, how this has basically behaved in terms of capital values. If you look again, though commercial activity was slow in Mumbai, Delhi, but if you see the capital growth, let's say the second column I'm referring to, if you see Mumbai at the compared to 100, it's today 181. So Mumbai has seen the highest capital appreciation along with Thane and Navi Mumbai across India when it comes to residential assets appreciating in capital values. If we bring to again pre-2008 levels. If I'm looking at other cities like Kolkata, Pune, Gurga are doing extremely well. Bangalore and Chennai have been stable. Hyderabad has seen basically you know lowest growth along with Noida and uh, Delhi. So this is how you can see that India 
though a commercial growth happened in other cities, the residential capital appreciation happened in the different cities. So Delhi has done, Delhi doesn't reflect that. Other than Delhi, if you see Mumbai as a region, MMR, which is basically Mumbai, Thane and Abhi Mumbai has seen the best appreciation pre lehman crisis and post lehman crisis. So in terms of when we go to unsold inventory, there are again two columns there. First column shows average inventory and the second shows unsold inventory. So when we see how average inventory versus unsold inventory that clearly reflects that, you know, let's say for example, Delhi should normally there is a 17 months of inventory always there. It's historically, if you see, this has been a trend of 17 months. But currently Delhi has 40 months of unsold inventory. If I can go to Gurgaon, against 18, currently is 38. So if you see this, this graph, it clearly shows that it shows that you know, the two cities which are comfortable at this point of time in terms of inventory levels, which are below the average levels, that is Pune and Kolkata. Other than Pune and Kolkata, Bangalore and Hyderabad seem to be in a comfortable position and Thane seems to be in a comfortable position. Other cities have little hangover in terms of the current supply and we believe this, the business picking up this situation will change dramatically in two to three quarters. And that two to three quarters will be quite significant for investors when they come to investing into specifically in the this residential sector in the specific cities. Let me walk you through retail. We, we, we spoke about commercial, we spoke about residential, now we talk about retail. You'll be surprised to see there is a clear shortage of retail space getting built into India. So there are only 261 so-called operational malls in India. If I am referring to 261 malls, these are malls which are can be classified as a proper mall, which is a uh, which is the basic criteria of classifying it as a shopping mall. There may be multiple retail establishments, but we can categorize those malls which we believe they are of the category which we can actually classify them. So with 261 malls, there is 70 million square feet of stock currently occupied as 57 and there is a vacant stock of 13 million square feet. Now if I take this number, it is hardly 15-17% which is vacant. So this is not an alarming number, actually it reflects that we are not geared up for a major uh, boom which we expect to happen once the business start looking up. So we are looking at basically we will have 228 new malls additionally which will come by 2020 and there are around 8,500 supermarkets coming up by 2016. And are we geared up for it? Absolutely no. We are basically at this point of time in India, we have gone completely short in terms of inventory when it comes to retail. Is it a time to invest into India? Let me walk you through yes or no. Let me share with you what makes us feel that we are very confident about why India should be looked upon. IT sector we expect 20% growth annually for the next 7 years. Now with the rupee stabilizing, we believe western uh, western part of the world will grow much more faster. We have much more clarity. So IT sector is going to be the biggest beneficiary in the space. Retail, according to us, from 8 to 20 percent is something what we expect by 2020. With urbanization, we expect 215 million people to be added into cities in by 2025. We expect industrial growth to quadruple from here. We expect travel and tourism to grow from $144 billion to $431 billion by 2020. Education sector to grow by $50 billion by 2015, by 2015 that's next year. And the last sector which we believe that is healthcare from $144 billion by to $280 billion by 2020. All these numbers make us feel that we are in a situation where the reforms are going to happen, where there is very little uh, uh, opportunity in terms of you know not going uh, uh, aggressive in terms of your port portfolio in India, and there is a lot more opportunity in terms of to make capital appreciation and participate in the India growth story, which is specifically related to investing into urbanization and benefiting from the capital appreciation. I would like to thank everybody and I'll be there for the Q&A session and I'd like to hand over to my uh, uh, other panelists. Hello and uh, thank you Mr. Ahuja for that enlightful uh, presentation and information about real estate. Now I would like to invite Mr. Agrawal, Mr. Neeraj Agrawal who is the Vice President 
in JLL that, that uh, no sorry so sorry I would like to invite Mr. Neeraj Agarwal who is Associate Vice President Family Office Services IL and FS Trust Mr. Agarwal now you can just start with your presentation sir thanks Kabi uh, thanks for the insight uh, I'll just briefly take you through the uh, presentation which is administration of immutable assets in India. Uh, primarily, I will take you through the uh, broad definition of immutable properties, uh, brief about NRIs, and then I'll catch on to the major concerns that we have understood from various NRI families for whom we are managing assets, what are the various options which are available, and uh, what are the criteria that uh, the NRI, NRI needs to consider before choosing the most appropriate option. Um, right. So, yes. so uh, briefly, immovable property as per the law is anything which is attached to the land or anything which is fastened to something which is attached to the land. But prime concerns uh, which are India specific is that the Indian judicial and the legal framework is not very conducive for speedy resolution. And, uh, and hence uh, analyze and uh, what our experience have been that a lot of families are facing such queries or problems uh, which are related to uh, the, the framework. And the, uh, the uniform laws, there is there's a lack of uniform laws which makes it difficult to manage geographically diverse assets. There are concerns like stamp duty which are state specific. There are laws which uh, needs uh, approval from the local courts or high courts such as probate and other things. Uh, being about global Indian families, right? Uh, uh, most important thing what we have experienced is that most of the global Indian families are based on US, UK, Middle East and Singapore. Uh, these geographies have, uh, let's say, complex tax and legal uh, regimes. Uh, real estate have been a key area of interest for investment for NRIs and could be one of the important reasons could be because of the returns that these residential and commercial assets have delivered in the last decade. Right. Uh, brief about how uh, immovable property uh, acquisition can happen. Uh, for NRI or a PIO, they can freely acquire or purchase any immovable property in India. There are some prohibitions like agricultural land, plantation property and farmhouse. He can do a direct remittance from uh, the NRE account or if he has uh, Indian assets or funds in his NRO accounts, uh, even that can be used to buy assets, immovable properties. The other options could be when he receives any immovable property through inheritance or if any he receives a gift from an Indian resident or any other NRI as well. The major concerns that we have seen uh, primarily are uh, as, as I mentioned, right, the most important thing is the stamp duty concerns. So whenever it changes hand, whenever a, a sell happens or a buy happens, there are stamp duty implications which are quite high. The administrative hassles for overseeing Indian assets are uh, are quite. Uh, uh, there are tax and compliance implications in terms of the rental income, and specifically for NRI who don't have a base in India or probably they are looking for investment in India but they don't have an established entity in India, it becomes very difficult to oversee all the activities. They are very keen on buying immovable properties in India, but the problem is that, okay, who will do the rent agreement? Who will ensure that the rent gets collected? Who will ensure that the Indian tax uh, are, will be duly paid and other things, right? Uh, and one, of the, one of the important concerns will also be to ensure safeguard and protect the immovable assets uh, against any encroachment, against any unlawful claims, and how, how to settle all those claims. And uh, last but not the least, one issue would be the succession planning of these removal assets. Uh, in cities like Bombay, Calcutta and Chennai, which are princely states, uh, there could be a requirement of probate before these assets can go into the hands of the next generation. Probate typically is a time consuming process when uh, the bill needs to be executed and to be presented in the court of law, which is time consuming and involved Hassles. Uh, there was a research that, that happened some time back wherein uh, a group of people were asked about uh, uh, in, in your experience uh, what would be the main reason of family conflict in India unfortunately treated on the top of it wherein 61% of the Indians believe that family wealth has led to the family conflict. So which is true uh, 
the number of bills that we see people contesting it uh, and, and the family conflicts coming open uh, coming in public or the disputes coming in public are, are quite high. Okay. So what are the various options that typically have? So there are typically two ways. One, a person can own the assets directly in their individual name. Uh, administration is an important aspect which they need to consider. Uh, when we talk about rent agreements, property taxes, rental income, compliances, tax filings, all there becomes all, all these things become their individual responsibilities. And as and when they need to be transmitted or to the next generation, what property something happens. So when I'm talking about succession plan, it is difficult because uh, it is generally advised that a uh, succession planning should be done in the country where the assets are held. So if, if the family is planning to buy some assets in India, typically the, the advice is that you should have an asset, you should have a, a succession planning structure in India. So before a family plan, plans or an NRI plans to invest into India, these are the important constraints, these are the important aspects that a family should look at. However, uh, just a thought, if an appropriate structure can be done or if a private trust is done, this is what we have been seeing a lot of companies, uh, specifically NRIs, who wants to set up a structure in India, they are looking for uh, setting a private trust. The key advantages could be that uh, although it will not be a separate legal entity, but from a tax perspective it will be an entity which will be, which will be in India, uh, where you can appoint a, a, a advisor or a trustee, which could be a corporate entity, which will be responsible for doing all the paperwork, doing all the administration, as per the guidance of the settler or the advisory board, which could be an NRI. Okay. Uh, the benefit of in such a structure is that a corporate trustee can discharge all the responsibilities and while discharging all the responsibilities it will be done under a fiduciary capacity, which means he is legally responsible to take care of all the compliances, all the reportings. Moreover, from a succession planning perspective, since a private trust succession does not involve the complicated probate process, it will be very easy to ensure that God forbid if something happens to the uh, current set of people who are on the advisory board, it can be smoothly transmitted to the next generation without uh, much of hassles. Right? Uh, if I touch briefly on what are the succession planning aspects of a immovable assets and what could be done. If it, nothing is done, uh, in, in legal terms we call it as an empty state. Uh, this happens when the person or the owner dies without recording his or her intentions. In India, the succession laws are based on the religion. So for Hindu, it will be a Hindu succession act, whereas for a Muslim, it will be their personal laws. Typically, this demands uh, a letter of administration or a succession certificate, which is a bit tedious, takes some time to get it from uh, the, the required court. The other option could be writing a will. Very honestly, it is one of the easiest way to transfer the wealth post last time. Uh, most of the families, it is as high as 92% of the families, transfer their assets to a will. However, being a testamentary instrument, it is executed only on the demise of the person. And hence, it, there is always a possibility of somebody contesting it or the, there is a dispute coming up within the family and hence uh, uh, it is happening. A lot of NRI with whom we are in touch with are in a situation where they are the legal owner of some assets, which is in India. But because of uh, lack of time and the, because of their abroad, it is difficult for them to administer those assets and to claim their right to ownership from those assets. Uh, if we see and say that okay, uh, if, if a family creates a trust, uh, one of the benefits that could be taken from a trust structure is a bankruptcy bonus uh, structure to an extent, which means God forbid if something happens, then also the assets which are lying in the trust are in bank. The entire responsibility of managing the assets, safe customizing the assets lies with the corporate trustee. It is it provides flexibility to cover the future generation beneficiaries. So because the ownership continues to remain in the name of the trust, it provides confidentiality to an extent and it provides adequate control over the assets. So the whole idea is that the ownership lies with the trust, the legal ownership remains with the trust. But the beneficial interests, the control, lies within the family member who can advise the corporate trustee on how it needs to be taken care of. Just to give you an example, uh, the, the, the diagram that you are seeing is of a simple trust. So it, it, is, it is typically a settler. A settler is a person who could be an ally who settles a trust. 
actual Indian Trust Act or Indian Trust, a trust which is settled in India can only hold Indian assets. Uh, trustee could be a corporate entity like IFS or any other corporate who would be responsible for managing the assets as per the intentions of the uh, as per the intentions of the settler. The settler will have complete control in terms of distribution, in terms of purchase, in terms of uh, giving on rent and all other things. So from a control perspective, the settler doesn't, doesn't lose the control. However, from an ownership perspective, the assets are bought in the name of the trustee and trustee remains the, uh, the legal owner of the assets. They have the settler would appoint advisory board members who would, who would take decisions on behalf of the trust after the advice of the settler. And hence the control always remains within the hands of the family member. He can also write a letter of wishes for a trustee where his last intentions can be recorded. And there could be a set of beneficiaries who could be Indian residents or could be analyzed, who will ultimately get benefited from these set of assets. To maintain the vision of the functioning of a trustee, a protector can also be appointed who will take care of other responsibilities. Right. Uh, one thing which is very important in case a suitable succession plan has not been done, uh, the main challenge is the top three uh, points that we have seen is that the legal heads may have to a long run process of legal matters to claim their rights. In fact, there are a couple of families whom we are advising on such matters. And then it becomes not only a time consuming process but also a costly process. Uh, second important aspect is that in case of a, in case a, a, a appropriate plan is not being drafted, ultimately it will result in the breakup, the, the split of assets. So if there is a large group of uh, a property where the intention is to ensure that it remains as one unit, it will be difficult to continue if the suitable succession plan has not been done. The most important thing is also the legal uh, aspect because if, if there is any uh, dispute that happens within the family, it becomes public and it has a huge negative impact on the reputation of the uh, The most important aspect that needs to be considered, considered uh, before choosing the most appropriate plan is the stamping implication, the taxation aspects, and inheritance and estate duty uh, aspect. I don't know in India there is no concept of estate duty. It was abolished way back in 1985. But I don't know, at some point in time, if estate duty gets reintroduced in India, then it will have uh, it will be very beneficial for the family who have made trusts appropriately so that uh, the assets can be protected from any estate duty implications. Although it will purely depend upon the law, the form in which the law gets introduced. But there is a no possibility of being benefited. Right. Uh, so, we identify a suitable plan or a, a, a structure. The point that we need to keep in mind is the intentions and the objectives of the family. The growth and uh, preservation objectives. Uh, a lot of families whose objective is to preserve certain set of assets have, advised, have been advised to form a trust and to transfer the properties into the trust to ensure that they remain as one unit and all the family members will have the rights of staying in the unit but they will not be allowed to sell the unit for monetary benefits. Uh, it can also help in legacy and philosophy depending upon the objective of the family. Uh, so how do we touch upon how access can help access from the world to this community company in India? We are present this business since 1995. Uh, we will provide you a complete solution. So it's a one shop shop for uh, requirement where you would like to understand your objectives uh, and suitably advise you whether you should go ahead with a will or have a family trust, whether the assets are to an extent where you need a family trust or not. Once a appropriate structure has been created, we can also take care of the annual administration of assets, which we view day to day operations. Uh, including all transactions with the bank, expense management, coordination with investment managers, and property management. Finally, tax and other compliance services will be taken care of by us uh, through respective entities. It will include fund accounting, audit, filing of returns, taxes, and representation to any tax authorities if required. So, and, and briefly uh, about uh, our key competencies, uh, we are the largest and oldest trusted company offering family office solutions to our clients since the past 19 years. The total assets that, that are there under our administration is around 4 lakhs and 12 crores. 
uh, we have one of the most strongest management team with professionals from finance and uh, legal disciplines. And we can advise and integrate back to the sport because we don't offer wealth management advice and services. So our advice is really uh, customer centric. And uh, since 1995, we are advising the companies on various aspects related to succession and estate planning of Indian assets. So we, uh, this is right. So this is what I'd like to uh, cover. I won't be here, and in case we have any queries pertaining to uh, my my aspect, I will be more than happy to answer. Uh, I hand over uh, the uh, rights to. Hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for passing on the responsibility to me. Uh, when we talk about investment into the real estate, and particularly in India, we just thought what are the legal issues involved in all those things, so many legal hassles, how to go about the things. And particularly with the NRI, apart from the host of the Indian laws and things, the first thing is how it is to invest in India. Let me start by how can NRI invest in real estate in India. Acquisition and just a global property in India by NRI and PIOs and foreign ventures of non Indian estate is valued in terms of. And the foreign exchange is directly with notification issue there and there. Typically, an NRI and PMR PIO is allowed to do foreign investment in properties. They can invest in any mobile property or they can purchase any mobile property in India except at cultural land, farmhouse, and the additional property. There is no restriction on the number of property that can be bought by them. They can get any mobile property. From Indian resident, Indian citizen residing mostly in India, PIO, other than the agricultural land, farm and plantation property. NRI PIO can also obtain any property by inheritance under the FEMA. They can also transfer any property to any resident of India by sale. NRI PIO can transfer any agricultural land, farm or plantation land to any resident of India by gift. Or they can transfer residential or commercial property by means of gift to any person either residing in India or abroad or abroad. So there is always a, you can see there is a demarcation between the uh, residential commercial property and the uh, agricultural land. So there are no restrictions on the purchase of the agricultural land which can be done only with the approval of Reserve Bank of India, except where in cases there has been approved by inheritance. There is no restrictions on the residential or commercial property. Anywhere in India they can purchase it. There is no restriction on the number of the properties. Foreign national of non-Indian origin. Resident outside India shall not acquire transfer any immobile property in India other than on lease, not exceeding five years, without prior approval of RBI. Similarly, an NRI is not allowed to invest in its form of property concerned, engaged in the real estate business. Real estate business means taking land and removing property with a view to earning profit or earning income therefrom. So typically an NRI can invest or purchase a house, but he cannot invest in a firm or a proprietorship which is engaged in the business of the real estate. Now coming to how the purchase acquisition has been funded by an NRI. The payment of purchase price in value for acquisition of removed property should be made out of fund received in India through normal banking channels by way of timber debitors from any place outside India. So you can sitting in say US or in the Middle East, you can get from there you can make debitors into your for purchase of property into India. Or fund hands in any non-resident account maintain in accordance with the provisions of the Act and the regulation given by RBI. That is your NRD account or NRO account or SNR account. No payment of purchase price for acquisition of immobile property shall be made either by traveler's checks or by foreign currency notes or by other mode other than those specifically permitted as above. Well. The RBI 
and NRI can avail home loans from financial institutions and banks in India. A maximum of 80% amount is financed by the financial institutions or the banks. The rest has to be given by the NRI debt so that it is uh, as in the funding of, of the uh, loans for the uh, uh, real estate is concerned, NRIs are at par with the Indian citizens based in India. The remittance of the amount for down payment repayment can be done from the place of residence by normal banking channel or if someone is already getting income in India from sources like rent or dividend, he she can direct repay the loan as well. The NRI has to repay its principal amount as well as interest apart from that similar channel only. This is a very important aspect. So once you have taken the loan or once you have started the repayment, it has to be continued from the same source. Home loan in rupees availed by NRI's PIO from authorized dealer housing financials in India can be repaid by the close relative in India of the borrower. Suppose an uh, NRI is living outside India has availed any loan. So even a relative as defined a close relative under the Companies Act can repay the loan on behalf of the NRI. Another concern which comes to the mind of everybody when they are investing into the real estate. How about the repatriation of the money? Since I have invested my money, I am getting, I have acquired the property, but now when I am selling the property, whether I can repatriate the money back to my country or country or not. And I can repatriate the sale proceeds of removed property in India if the property was acquired out of a foreign exchange source that is remitted through normal banking channels by debit to NRE or CNRB account. The amount to be repatriated should not exceed the amount paid for the property in foreign exchange received through normal banking channel or by debit to NRE account. Foreign currency equivalent as on the date of payment or debit to CNRB account. So it means suppose you have purchased a property for say 1 million. So when you are going to repatriate, the same amount can be repatriated. There is a little restrictions on the residential property even the, in the event of sale of residential property by an NRI PIO. The repatriation of sale personally is restricted to two residential properties. There is a uh, planning what an NRI can do in such a scenario. He can purchase the property in the different members of his family and each person will be eligible to repatriate the money in respect of the two residential properties. And an NRI PIO may remit an amount not exceeding 1 million per financial year out of the balance held in NRO account, sale proceed of asset by way of purchase, the assets in India acquired by him by way of inheritance legacy out of public funds. This is subject to production of documentary evidence in support of acquisition inheritance and income tax compliance. Remittance exceeding 1 million dollar in any financial year requires a prior permission of RBI. So as I have already said, Proper planning can be done, suppose if you are acquiring or purchasing any property, purchasing it in the name of different family members, so for each family members you can repatriate up to $1 million in every financial year. Another good aspect which uh, under the Indian law is that there is a full refund of application money, unless money, purchase consideration made by all building agency, cancellation, net of taxes. So suppose you have booked a house and there is some want to cancel it, so whether you can refund it or not, that is one of the things that uh, has come to your mind. So there is no restrictions on the repatriation of such money which has been cancelled or there is any dispute, some agreement to sale is there, it has been cancelled, so you can always take back that money. Once you have purchased the property, once you have done the things, the next thing, some, what will be the tax treatment? Whether I, uh, as I will be governed by the Indian laws or as per the country of my, where I am residing. Under the present taxation laws, NRIs, the benefit for NRI are very similar to the tax benefit of a resident Indian. The NRI is entitled to all tax benefits related on purchase of property that a resident Indian is. So you can claim a rupees 1 lakh deduction under section 80C of the Indian Income Tax Act. You can also lease the property. The only catch is there, an NRI will have to pay the applicable tax if he is residing in the country where worldwide tax income is taxable, like USA, unless the country has a double tax agreement with India. 
The special advantage for NRI is the amount which is paid for the interest of home loan is deductible from NRI taxable income without any upper limit. What does it mean? In India, once somebody has taken a loan, the maximum limit which is allowed is 150,000 per year as a deduction from the income. But in the case of the NRI, suppose your interest portion is almost going to 3 lakhs or 4 lakhs rupees, the entire amount can be deducted from the Indian income. So to that extent, you are getting the tax benefits on that. Like normal Indian, the, if the NRI is selling the property, the same rules of capital gain tax will be applicable to him. That is, if he is selling after holding the property for more than three years, the rate of capital gain tax will be 20%. If it's uh, that is a long-term capital gain, if it's a short-term capital gain, then 30% will be applicable. Now let's what are the points to be considered when you are purchasing the property. Investment in real estate is a simple but long term move, so one should be cautious enough at the time of purchase to secure the deal. First thing is what we when we are purchasing the property, we have to be clear about the property title. The title of property should be clear from all issues and the seller should have the required right to sell it, especially if it is inherited or any joint property. So what you can do, you can always approach a lawyer who can verify the title of the property, you can approach a developer who is very much reputed, so there are very less chances of any their title related dispute. No new certificate, always check that there will be no outstanding electricity, water, bills or any other authority due pending with the property. Take a new, uh, no new certificate from the seller at the time of purchase. This is particularly important in the case of the resale of the properties. Bank release letter, it is always advisable to take a bank release letter from the concerned bank if the property had been mortgaged as security in any type of loan. This is important both if you are purchasing an under construction property or if a resale property. Many times developers mortgage up their land in favor of the bank and raise the funds. So when you are turning into an agreement to sale, before turning into an agreement to sale, take a specific letter, release letter from the bank that the particular flat or particular house which you are taking from the developer has been released from the mortgage. Same thing when you are selling, they are getting the property from resale. Take the uh, bank release letter from the bank if the house was mortgaged by the seller. Then you should always check whether the property has all the approvals and permits, whether the commitment certificate is there, if you are purchasing for the developer, whether the occupation certificate is there. So you, you should you can use the uh, help of your local broker or uh, some lawyers who can give you the clearance on all those things. Always make a safe deal. Whenever you plan to invest in real estate, you should go through the proper channels, either through a friend or relative to ensure the authenticity of property. Nowadays, a lot of online web portals are there, which uh, from where you can uh, choose the properties. You can also approach through the property expos and seminar to choose the right property. It will be wise to get the title paper, papers of the property verified by lawyer before going ahead. This is a very important thing. In a property deal or a real estate, the title is the most important thing because all your future investments and your ownership rights depend on the same. Another issue which comes to the NRI is, okay, I am living in the US or in the Middle East or the UK and if I have to purchase or sell the property, whether I have to come personally into India, I have to do the transaction, how much time it will take, I don't have that time. So the most easy way is you can give a power of attorney to a reliable person or to your close relative who is resident in India and who may be able to act on your behalf to complete formalities such as registration, possession, execution of agreement or sale. So you need not to come personally to India. Even in a state like Maharashtra, now they have started the facility of e-registration. So you can run the online registration of the properties. Uh, thank you. I will be available for any question relating uh, legal questions relating to the real estate, commercial or residentials. I hand it over to the Kabir. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Shivastav. It was a wonderful presentation and the legal aspect which is very important for NRIs. So uh, now I would like to start the question answer round which uh, I will read out the questions from the various people who are listening and the attendees and uh, whoever can answer from uh, the Mumbai office, please answer. One of the first questions which we got was what is the minimum investment to go in the trust route? 
This was asked by Mr. Ravi Sithapati. 